You are now in the realm of enlightenment and transformation. Welcome to Chief Speaks. All music performed and produced by you. Enlightenment comes from allowing yourself to journey through the dark shadow of death, the primordial abyss of wisdom's waters. For it is the treasures and mysteries that lie waiting in the dark that transform us and propel us to a new enlightened state. One should never aspire to live in the light nor the dark, but should journey between the two in order to evolve the overall reality into a self-actualized creation. Knowledge is your light. As wisdom is your darkness, the bold interplay of the two in your life leads you to an enlightened understanding of yourself and the inner verse you've created. Male is your enlightenment. Female is your transformation. Child is your evolution. Woman, accept the light into your darkness, so it may enlighten you. Man, go bring your light boldly into the darkness so that it may transform you, enlighten you. you i love you so much because you just don't know what you've just done for me thank you so much wow okay. this is like the best call i've had in ages on btr so this show was was meant for me to be able to hear today and i'm so thankful that's his, uh, his home for now a new pathway has now been cut in order to get to the almighty where there may not have been one so the communication with them if they have enough power and strength i talk to us the communication we get every week that's one of the reasons i don't get into the current events thing too much because it starts to become a perpetual alarm clock that we just keep hitting snooze on i speak to the ascended masters quote unquote i talk about spiritual stuff but i also speak about some very practical we can do today things be as natural as you can be with your spiritual you can't always go by your feelings because your feelings are corrupted your feelings are just as corrupted as everything else your chakras and everything else you got to know what's beyond you and that's why we have elders we can't do everything you can't get everything out of books or or weekend certification. You can have the most powerful, ancient, oldest, most, as far as you know, truthful tradition in your hands. And if you still have a, a dirty um, spirit, you're not gonna get anything out of it. You're not gonna learn anything. You're not actually gonna grow. I try to teach in a way where I make myself obsolete. That's always been my goal, to make myself obsolete. Um, I really wanted to, you know, kind of big you up, um, you know, I think you're awesome. There's a lot of elders out here right now that that want to know what's going on. They're not getting on Twitter and stuff like that, but they want to be up on, on the new stuff. You know, sit down and have some conversations with them. You know, it's not always about hearing their story. It's also about being news reporters for them and letting them know, like, yeah, this is what's, what's happening right now. They may tell you something about what happened in Charleston that you couldn't even... Your spirituality has to create the same spiritual family, okay? And that family exists first inside of you. You have to express the different expressions of, of that rainbow coalition of, of, of spirits inside of you first. Okay, don't don't let communities hijack that rainbow. The problem is when we come into the conscious community, the dudes are doing the same thing that the women are doing. I just want to say that I really enjoy your show every Sunday, and um, my friend and I call it going to church. You know, when we call him, we're like, you going to church? You know, and I'm like, where have y'all been at? God cannot go against its own truth. So anytime you have an inkling that God is going against its own truth, then God is no longer behaving as God. So therefore, the spiritual community doesn't recognize God. You dig where I'm coming from? Or can we have a new thought? Can we step outside of the books for a second and have a new conversation about hair weaves and wigs? You know, can we have a new conversation about homosexuality? Can we have a new conversation about vegan eating? It's a good day for an exorcism. Three four seven nine four five seven six eight zero. Call in and let's build. Greetings and welcome to another Chief Speaks on enlightenment and transformation. I want to welcome all of you first-time listeners and watchers. I guess I always say listeners, but I should say listeners and watchers. Now that we're doing uh, more video content, and I also want to welcome all of you coming in from the archives, coming in from iTunes, and all the various podcast media uh, mediums, such as Blog Talk Radio. Uh, if you're not a subscriber of this channel, I encourage you now to do so. You don't want to miss anything that's going on. And the same goes for the Blog Talk, Blog Talk channel. 
Block Talk Radio, you can just click the uh, follow button and then you'll know uh, when we're doing shows, impromptu or whatever. So yeah, my name is Chief Yuya and I want to welcome you. Uh, as many of you know, we've been doing uh, themes for this year of 2016 and this month's theme, we're now in the month of August, uh, this month's theme is unity, unity, which is um, it's very fitting. You know, you consider we're at the time of the summer solstice and um, that summer solstice, which really signifies what the first eye is doing or the son of man, the sun inside of our bodies, uh, which many of us refer to as the brow chakra. And um, for the sun to be at its, its apex uh, during the summer season, uh, it requires and calls for a unification of the body or the unification of all the components that exist and subsist, subexist uh, underneath that, that sun paradigm. So it's the same thing, you know, you have your brow chakra and then you have chakras underneath it, but you have, uh, you have many different meridian and, and uh, activity points and, and entities, even and archetypes that we identify with that exist underneath what we would consider to be the most high or the brown chakra, the brow chakra, which then um, once we can unify those and we can regulate their rhythms, regulate their movements, you know, that's one of the, the key responsibilities of the pineal organ, which is, you know, what we call that brow chakra or that, that son of man. It's, it's one of its key responsibilities is to regulate our, the, the rhythm of our organs. Well, in our last session, I spoke to you and I said that the Orisha and all these various archetypes that you look at, those are the actual organs in your body. So you start to understand that it is that, that sun or that, um, that true self, that more real self that we communicate and project ourselves through that uh, govern uh, those Orisha or those archetypes. So it's not that they crown you and they then govern everyone else. In fact, it is your own force and your own will and your own sun that controls and governs those particular energies. You know, so speaking about unity, because again, that's what today's segment is on. Um, we're tapping into that vibration. And last segment, you know, I answered some emails and uh, hopefully in answering those emails, I was able to also address maybe some of the concerns that some of you all have been having or some of the questions that you've wanted to ask and have not asked. But aside from the addressing of emails, uh, we also just dealt with, um, in a very simple sense, uh, the concept or, or some of the misconceptions surrounding this, this idea, this grand idea of um, unity. And we certainly covered the idea uh, of unity being a form of conformity. And hopefully we were able to dispel that myth uh, in our last segment. Uh, if not, I I'm sure by the time we go through it a little bit more and break it down a little bit more and take it from part to part to part to part. We'll understand it a bit more. But um, what I wanted to deal with in this segment is the concept of the individual uh, archetype, archetypical, arch archetypical uh, components that make up uh, the unified movement or unified organism in this realm. You know, every realm has different archetypes that exist within it. Just like uh, within the astral planes and the mental planes, you're gonna have different things that exist. If you, if you take a look at uh, how you may dream at times, you'll find that when you have certain types of, of dreams, depending on their uh, profundity, depending on uh, even some, for some of us, how traumatic they may be, you'll find that there's always certain type of energies that are present and certain type of energies that are not present which gives you an idea because your dreams are, are, are traveling through the astral planes. So at different levels of the planes, different energies will exist and different energies can exist. Some can't be in certain places. You know, um, you're not gonna have very base energies that are gonna exist at the higher levels. Um, to elucidate and just to give a, a basic example, um, you may have a, a, um, a hamster at home and that hamster can do tricks maybe the hamster can run through a wheel it can hit a button to get its water so forth and so on but that's not necessarily going to 
qualify uh, that hamster to take a master levels course at a university. That hamster is not going to be in that space. So whenever you go into that university and you go and you sit at a desk or you're, you're, you know, you're in a lecture hall, you're not going to look to the right or left and see a hamster there with a tablet, you know, taking notes because they just can't, they don't have what it necessarily takes to exist at that level. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the hamster is less intelligent. It just means that the tool set that that hamster is working with is not the tool set that's, that's, uh, that, that's requisite for that space, for that astral plane. Now the hamster may want to go there, the hamster may want to be there, but what it's gonna need is a cosine for somebody from that place. So sometimes we drag lower and base energies into our higher realms by cosigning them, by making them feel like they can be someplace. It's very similar to, uh, there's a saying that sometimes people say, um, if you see a wise man arguing with a fool, uh, then you see two fools arguing. You know, and I know when I was young, I used to always say, like, people would try to argue, so I'm not going to argue with you because you're an idiot. If I argue with you, then I'll be an idiot. And then I heard about that phrase later. You know, so it's, it's the same concept. If you know that you're vibrating at a level that another one isn't and maybe would like, they would like to be there, but they don't know how to be there the right way and, to, and, and in a merited way, sometimes what they'll do is they'll try to engage you in a way where you attach yourselves to them. You'll argue with them. So then when you return back home, you'll take them back with you. When you return back to your natural vibration, or like the saying we say, uh, water meets its own, reaches its own level, or it seeks for its own level. So ultimately, you're always going to fall back into your own vibration. And we may have what we call angels, or we may call uh, guys or helps or, or demons even, who may help us along the way. They may sometimes open a door and introduce us to a higher vibration and say, look, this is how life could be if you would stop doing this or if you would start doing that. And sometimes we delude ourselves into thinking that uh, because we've now achieved some proximity to a higher level that we're actually the ones wielding um, the gateway and the power to that higher level. Sometimes we don't realize that no, someone is just showing you grace or a particular force or energy is showing you grace and giving you an opportunity to be in that space. So. In each realm, you're going to have energies that operate in that realm that uh, comprise a working organism. You know, so let's say when we speak about a human, and in this realm, a human we know at least needs a brain, a heart, um, and we'll say some form of a digestive system. At the very least, a human needs a, a brain and a heart, right? Now you may go to another realm and humans don't need brains, you see. You may go to another realm, humans don't need reproductive organs, you see, depending on the laws that govern that realm, you see, depending on the laws that govern that realm will determine how things manifest and characterize themselves within that space. So there are certain elements that are always present in this realm and and I, I will share what gave me the motivation uh, or the stimulus I don't want to say that stimulus but the idea to even speak about this uh, with you all um, I was watching a movie and the theme of the movie is um, Mythica I'm not sure when it came out because I was just kind of you know um, going through some movies real quick and I watched this Right. And um, as far as movies go, it wasn't really about much. <laughs> you know, I think there's like three or four parts to it now, too. Uh, it seems to be like an indie film, even though it was uh, Kevin, uh, I want to say Soro or Soro, yeah, Soro, something like the guy who played uh, Hercules back in the 90s. Um, but he was in it for like 10 seconds, literally, you know, but I think it was an indie film. But um, there was something in it that made me think about uh, this month's topic and, again, the concept of unity. And it's something that I've noticed in every movie that's dealing with any type of fantasy adventure or mythology or um, anything where there's like a hero's journey or a hero's quest. 
you know, you'll always see certain elements um, present. Even if you look at like X-Men or you look at the Avenger, Avengers, um, you look at, uh, we could take it further back, um, The Hobbit, you know, J.R. Tolkien's work. We can look at Dungeons and Dragons, which was a real easy um, understanding of this, uh, The Fantastic Four. Uh, which we know the Fantastic Four was based on the, the, the elements, you know, fire, water, air, and earth. But uh, even in those elements, we learned some clues as to the archetypical spirit, spirit types that exist um, within the greater soul body, right? So there's four of them, okay? There's, there's four, and there's more than four, but I'm, I'm really going to speak about for the purposes of this show and, in perfect, and for the purposes of, of um, brevity, there, I'm going to speak about the four core ones. And what you'll find in, again, any of those genres where you're watching the films or you're reading the books, um, especially, like I said, when there's a hero's journey, because you remember a hero's journey is Haru's journey. It's always about redeeming the light. Haru means light or that which is above or even master. So, you know, what are you mastering? You're mastering everything that is underneath that which is above. It takes us again to that, that relationship to the, to the first eye, to the sun. Well, what exists beneath it? Emotions, you know, uh, like fear and, and, and greed and things like that. Um, primarily emotions, you know, exist um, beneath this, you know. Um, so when you're dealing with the concept of the hero's journey, what you have, the four main uh, core archetypes that you see often present and represented in literature as well as um, film, you'll have the wizard is one, uh, or the magician, uh, which you know I also use the term magician, which also would be the sorcerer or the sorcerist, okay? Um, which is different than the other archetype, which we often, we intertwine them together, but they're not the same, and I'll, I'll get into that. You also have the priest, right, or the cleric, uh, which we would often use as well. Priest, priestess, cleric, uh, spiritual, devotee, um, some would even go as far to say the guru archetype. And then, of course, you will always have the warrior or the barbarian, okay? Uh, which is another key archetype. And then after that, you'll have the thief. Okay? So if, if you notice with, um, again, any of those works, when someone is preparing to go on a, on a journey and they're assembling their team, those will be the people who they call for. You know, like when they're in a tavern and they're saying, um, I, I promise anyone their weight in gold if they go on this quest with me. A quest to do what? To defeat the, the warlord um, Xanax. <laughs> I don't know, whatever kind of name. We're going to go fight the warlord Xanax and his evil minions. And, you know, I promise you great treasure and, and you'll be the, the, the talk of fable and legend. Da, 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 da. And usually what happens is they can't find anybody or they find like the town drunk. Right. But they find that the town drunk is a master swordsman or, you know, like uh, even in the comedy Blazing Saddles, um, you had uh, Gene Wilder and, you know, he was he was a town drunk, but he had like the quickest hands in the West, you know, so he was a, a master marksman, you know. Um, so you find with these stories and with these archetypes, there's certain energies that always have to be present in order to redeem the light. Well, that tells us something. That tells us, number one, that these are energies that are present inside of us. That's, that's the first thing you gotta understand. That's why they put them in every story. Um, when, you're, when you're writing, you know, you're doing screenwriting or anything like that where it involves telling a story, basically it's telling a story, uh, what makes a lot of the stories very accessible to the audience is the elements that are inputted that are relatable to the audience in a very um, inherent or an innate sense. You know, so just like when we read stories that replay the Osirian tale, which they all do. All movies are the unlikely hero. And me? I have to go? But da, 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 da. You know, because they're happy, but then something happens that takes their happiness. And then they fall and then they have to go through a journey and then they rise back up to the top again. But they're now stronger and wiser. You know, usually 
they're battling someone who was close to them who betrayed them or something like that you know and typically redeeming a dead parent usually it's a father so you know that's you can find that in every story it's one of the reasons why i don't do uh movie decoding as much as i used to because um i started really getting into decoding probably uh in, in the like early 90s right so I never really heard anybody do movie decodes back then. It was, you know, because the type of movies I watched or even watched back then, there was always like a strong esoteric element to the stuff I liked. Um, but then as the years went by, and I'm not going to say I was the only one doing it, but, you know, more YouTube exposure, I started seeing, oh, this person does it too, this person does it. So I just kind of felt like I don't need to do it anymore because I, I used to do it with my students a lot. And then um, when I started seeing a lot of other people were doing it, I just refer them. Oh, go listen to so and so's breakdown. You know, I'm going, I'm going to do something else now. You know, um, so with the decoding, you find mainly it's just the Osirian myth that's spoke, spoken about over and over. And if it's not the Osirian myth, then it's some form of government conspiracy. You know, and you just get, well, I get tired of that after a while. And you'll understand why when you understand the archetypes. So let's go to, we'll start with, um, we'll, start, we'll start with the easiest one, the warrior. The warrior is the easiest one to figure out. And the reason being is because uh, the warrior or the barbarian, you know, you always had to, you look at Conan the Destroyer, uh, he had Grace, that's the one that had Grace Jones in it, right? And then you had Conan the, Barbar the barbarian, right? And then he was partnering with his wizard and then he had his thief. You know, and then you had the priestess. Same, it's always the same formula. You know, uh, the bar barbarian or the warrior's role in the redemption is the warrior is the doer. The warrior says, let's get this done. Um, the warrior, from a philosophical or a psychological perspective, the warrior vibration is always the one who wants to make sure you get the point. Okay, so... The warrior is the one who will break something down, like Ogun is, Ogun is acid, analytics. Break it down, 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 and make sure, do you, did you get this? Do you got it? You got it? Because the warrior is constantly trying to push through. Now, there's some, there's, some, um, there's some missteps that warriors commonly take because of that need to want to do. Um, in their youth, warriors can tend to be a bit impetuous you know, they, they tend to lack patience, you know, so they'll rush into situations because sometimes they're overconfident or they just feel like the sheer, uh, sheer brute strength and aggression can kind of win out. So they tend to win and teach through assertion or they win and teach through aggression, you know, um, but ultimately it's because they want to uh, not only protect, but they want to make sure that people receive what it is that they're supposed to in life. Warriors are typically not um, the best at seeing things through to the to the end. They're very good at, at getting things started. And what they prefer to do is to protect and clear the way for those who actually want to do something in life. You know, so again, if you look at like, um, look at any of the Conan or any type of movies like that where you have that barbarian element, You'll always have the warrior like Conan who comes in, saves the town, he saves the day, and then they say, well, we want you to lead us because we have nothing and we need to rebuild. And then he just gets on his horse and says, I will see you again. <laughs> and then someone else is left to rebuild after he fixes whatever the issue is that's present. Now with, with the barbarian or the warrior archetype, you'll find that the impatience, it never really goes away, you know. That's why you look at a lot of bands, right, and look at the drummer. The drummer usually has that, like, Ogun aspect, you know. They don't mind. Um, it's, it's either going to be the drummer or it's going to be the lead singer, right? But it's, it's going to be either someone who, who can just start the beat and say, listen, when, when I start, when I hit these sticks, one, two, three, we're going to go. Or the lead singer who just forces through the front is screaming in your face or singing and is making sure that everybody is getting it. You know, so that that's the warrior aspect um, 
or the barbarian aspect has its place in music and in art, but you find that the barbarian won't just do music or art for the, for, for the beauty of it. They're not necessarily concerned so much with beauty, but they're concerned more with, with uh, imbuing and, and projecting and expressing uh, a message, a message that can heal. You'll find that a lot of times warriors will be artists, um, not artists, excuse me, but doctors. They'll be surgeons. There'll be people who will go right into, cut into something, go into something in order to take care of um, whatever the ailment is or to remove whatever the ailment is that's uh, ailing a person. So that's what, what you find often with that warrior archetype. The warrior is the one that gets things done. And, and the warrior's not going to want to do a lot of talking. You know, the warrior just is going to kind of want to, you know, wait until people are ready to actually move or the warrior will just make a move. The warrior's not going to do a whole lot of pontificating. You're not going to get too much of that. Now, if you watch um, Dungeons and Dragons, again, you'll see that the little boy Bobby, he was eight years old. He was the barbarian. He, he's the one who had that big stick, you know, like a turkey leg, and he had the hat, the, the Viking hat. And every time danger would come, whether it be Venger or, or Tiamat, you know, the flying, the red dragon, or anybody, it was Bobby who would like run, but I got this, you know, he'd run head first and then be hitting that stick on the ground. And, you know, because uh, he, and they'd always say, wait, Bobby, no, it's too dangerous, you know, but he'd always rush right into it. Uh, you look at Fantastic Four with the with the thing. Uh, whenever something happened, we say it's clobbering time. He, he's not talking about a plan. He's not talking about strategizing. He immediately goes and no, we're gonna clob him. We're gonna beat the mess out of him. Uh, the Hawk, Hawk smash, plan Hawk. We got a plan, you know. So um, you find that the barbarian archetype, the warrior archetype, is is restless. Let's get this done. Um, they're the ones that while the meeting is going on, they're just sitting there with their pencil in their hand, like tapping or just, you know, their foot is shaking. You know, they're doing it like they, they, they're, they can't sit still, really, you know. Um, but then you have also, um, we'll go to another easy one. We'll go from easier to harder. Um, you have the thief, right? And a lot of times when we look at the thief, we look at thieves with, with negative connotation. But uh, in fact, Without the thief, we die. The thief is so necessary in our spiritual archetypes, our spiritual kingdoms. The thief is so necessary in our life, lives. Why? Because uh, the thief is the one who breaks the rules. The thief is the one who doesn't say why we have to do this. The thief says, why not? Why can't we do this? Let's do it. Let's see what happens. The thief is the one who's always pushing the line. You know, um, those thieves, thief art archetypes are innovators. They'll see what's already been laid down and they'll look at a better way to do it. And they don't have a problem with stealing an idea. That's why you find um, with that particular archetype, they're not always the best to confide in because they don't have a sense of sacredness when it comes to an idea. Their things should be easily and freely distributed as far as the thief is concerned. That's why you look um, in, in, in older times, you had uh, the gypsy culture, right? And gypsy we know is short for Egyptian. So the original gypsies, gypsies, uh, they were Africans, they were Moors, okay? But um, in any event, you know, it later became, oh, they're Italians, well, Sicilians. So the gypsies, a lot of people said, oh, gypsies are thieves, we don't want them here. They would like send them out of different territories, send them out of towns and things like that. And what it is, is not just that the gypsies were thieves. The gypsies didn't have the same sense of ownership that individuals had at that time. So if they're walking by your home and there's a peach tree there and there's peaches all on the ground, they're gonna take baskets and just come take all the peaches. Or they might take some out of the tree. Why? It's a tree. You don't own a tree. It's just a tree. We're going to eat, you know. So it was that sense of, of non-ownership. And you find that even today with gypsies. You know, like we say, um, a gypsy cab. What is a gypsy cab? It's a person who innovated. Innovated said, man, I'm not going to pay the city twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for a hack license. And I have a car. I know where people need rides. I'm just going to drive around and pick them up. <laughs> you know, or you have uh, they call the gypsy uh, gypsy auto body guys where they'll just they just drive around. They'll see people with smashed up cars and uh, they say, hey, I can fix that for you. You know, they pull over in this parking lot here and they got all their tools in the back and everything. 
Why? I don't need a license to fix cars. It's just, it's metal. Okay, well, yeah, this is easy. I got the tools, let's do it. You know, um, so they innovate. So the thief becomes a very important archetype, um, not only in the external spiritual environment, but of course, the internal spiritual environment. And I, I would also say, you know, for further understanding that, understanding that all of these archetypes exist inside of you. Remember, I said that in the beginning. So we all are the warrior, we all are the thief, we all are the wizard, we all are the priest. But the spirit or the soul picks one to predominantly project itself through. So some of us are mainly warriors, some of us are mainly the priests, some of us are mainly thieves, some of us are mainly the magicians, you see. So, um, but going back to the thief, again, there's an idea there of innovation. So um, when you're looking at it from an artistic perspective or a spiritual perspective, the thief is gonna be one that's gonna push the line and not be so concerned like the warrior or the barbarian about you getting the point. The thief is more concerned about changing the way you get the point. You know, why do we have to like, why do we have to play the guitar this way? You know, why can't we play it like this? Why can't we play it like this? Or Jimmy Hendrix, why can't I, you know, play with my teeth? You know, that's the thief aspect, the innovator. Um, you know, you just look at any innovations in society, look at who's been behind them. You take a person like Steve Jobs, you know, you, you're dealing with innovation. Um, now, of course, the thief, very similar to the warrior, is not necessarily going to be to want the one who's going to see something from beginning to end. I mean, in most instances, a thief is not one who's going to even have um, the sense of structure or sometimes integrity to lead long enough to see something through. You know, they, their minds just don't think like that. Their minds think more, more in a sense of... Um, this is the rule, you show me the rule, I learned the rule, now I know what I, what I need to twist and mangle and distort. So the, the, the thief is the artist aspect, and the thief takes chances that no one else is gonna, was gonna take. The thief looks at something and says, okay, let me, let me strategize and figure out how to get it, how to get to it, how to take that, so that I can have it for myself. But, and then after we learn these new strategies, like you look at, um, think about what Napster did back in the days, if you guys remember when Napster came out. Napster came out when we were still on dial-up modems, right? And it, it might take you two days to download uh, somebody's CD. You know, back then it was really about CDs. And it took forever, but you got it, whoa. I didn't have to go to Tower Records or Sam Goody, right? Remember all these, these those different places um, to pay 15 or $16 for a CD. I just let my modem run for two days, you know, um, thievery, but innovation. Now look what it did to the music industry. Look at how many people started careers and became millionaires because of this idea of digital distribution. You know, wait a minute, I don't, I don't have to get a, a, a deal anymore. Like I can have direct, you know, artist to, con to consumer interaction now. You know, it changed everything. You know, just, just from, and it began from an idea of, of thievery. And I, and I don't know, the individual who invented Napster, I don't know if his original intent was uh, thievery or if it was just sharing. Um, but there's a thin line between thievery and sharing, of course. You know, but um, certainly because of, of him saying, well, why can't we do it this way? Why can't it be this? You know, it innovated things and it pushed everything in a totally different direction um it 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 drove even computers you know in terms of the innovations in computers because now um computers and broadband and, and all these things needed to keep up with the demands of the consumer that were now created by this innovation i need to be able to download movies videos everything fast you know um I, I need to be able to have a computer that can play these things. I need to have a computer that I can use like an entertainment system because now I can watch movies on my computer. You know, so then it went to the phones. Well, can I watch a movie on my phone? Can I download something? Now everything is just speeding up and changing all because of this thieves and invasion, you see. Um, so that's what the thief really brings to the table um, and many other things. I'm, I'm making this short. Uh, and then after the thief, we have um, the priest. 
Okay, I would say that the, the priest is the third hardest to understand. The priest is often confused, again, with the magician. The priest has a desire to rapture people in a spiritual, um, a spiritual state of nirvana, but a spiritual state of ecstasy, right? Because the priest is all about inspiring, inspiration. Motivational speakers are priests, okay? Um, when you're dealing with the priest, the priest is more concerned about, the priest is not concerned so much about you getting a message. The priest is not so concerned about changing the way things are done. The priest is more concerned about uplifting, motivating, and inspiring. That's the goal of the priest. The priest wants to make sure that whatever you receive changes your consciousness changes your mindset you know has you thinking more from a conscious perspective the priest wants to take you take you out of the mundane um imaginings the mundane meanderings of your physicality and of your humanity and wants you to bring into bring you into a place where you're now focused on your higher thought your higher being and the priest may not be as adept as the thief the, the priest may not have the ability to color or to make things as interesting as the thief can, because the thief can make things very interesting. Uh, the priest may not have the brute force and strength of the warrior, um, but the priest's job is just to get you to a point where you want more, where you feel better about yourself, you feel happy even, you know. Um, many of our love goddesses or our deities of charm, like your Shangos, would fall under that priest category. You find that those entities, they, they talk a lot. You know, those type of Oshuns or those type of Shangos or those deities of, of oratorical skills, they do more talking than anything else. And not to say that there's anything wrong with that because the talking is necessary, but that's their major tool, you know, to get things across is speech. So they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. Now, what the priest does, um, through that ability to inspire and through that ability to speak, um, they kind of have the ability to bring you into a, a, a rapturous state of, of encouragement. Because that's essentially what they want to do. They want to encourage you to do certain things. They want to encourage you to believe certain things. They're almost similar to the, like, the Piscean energy, you know, where they want to encourage and distribute belief. But what it really is, is a lot of times with the priests, where they hang up with, where some of their challenges can be, um, sometimes they can fall into a subservient mindset for too long. Most priests need some time to study underneath uh, a guru or someone who has completely devoted and committed themselves to a particular, a particular way of learning, a, a particular way of being. And you'll have priests who will submit themselves to that learning submit themselves to that teaching but sometimes they get locked into that also you have priests a lot of times who may operate from the lower the lower vibration where they start to become um promoters of self idolatry or really idolatry towards them like you have your jim jones you know in jonestown they become um leaders of not necessarily cults because cults are not bad within and of themselves a cult is not a problem a cult is just culture if we say well this is the culture we want to live and we don't want another culture to infiltrate and to distort and taint what we want to do. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, um, in a country that's dead set on keeping citizens very uninformed and keeping people um, in line, uh, the idea of a cult becomes, you know, takes on a very destructive connotation. But uh, one who becomes so narcissistic and, and their, their drive to encourage and in thinking that they're the only ones that could do that. I heard someone recently say that in a video. He said, um, no one has healed uh, black boys to the level that I have, whether you're talking about an elder or anyone um, that is currently calling themselves doing the work right now. No one has ever done it on a level that I've done it. That statement by itself is asinine, but you know, just the idea again that, you know, your ego would, would be so out of control that you would, you could imagine that, um, you know, you, you are manifesting on a level higher than anyone ever has towards doing something that's um, a calling that many of us do 
and many of us should do. You know, you're just doing what you're supposed to do. Um, but just in making statements like that, you now negated everything you did any, anyway. And you bring into question if you really ever did do anything, right? So, you know, that becomes a trapping of the priest. A lot of the um, conscious speakers and conscious lecturers, they're actual priests. Uh, one of the reasons why I, I do speaking, but I, I try not to, whenever like the flyers are being made up or the promotions and I'm going to a different place, I usually try not to um, let them call me a motivational speaker. Sometimes they'll do that on the paperwork or on the tickets, they'll say motivational speaker. I don't really like that too much because you have to motivate yourself. I consider myself to be an inspirational speaker. You know, I can, I can bring you in, into a space where I can show you the spirits around you. Inspiration means in spirit. And when you see the spirits around you, you won't feel lonely. You won't feel discouraged. You won't feel doubt. You'll feel, okay, I can do this. I can get whatever done. Whatever is in front of me, I can get that accomplished. Um, so the job of the priest is to inspire, right? And then that takes us to, I would say, the most complex member of our, our four-part uh, archetype is, I would say, is the wizard or the magician or the sorcerer, sorceress. You know, you know the terms. We can go on and on and on. And again, a lot of times we mix that individual with the priest or priestess, and it's not the same. Because you can be a priest or priestess of knowledge. It doesn't have to have anything to do with magic. You could just be someone who distributes and shares and inspires people through knowledge and learning. So when you look at the archetype of the, um, you look at the archetype of the magician, which is what we're on now, you're dealing with someone who is more concerned with, with manifesting. They're not even as concerned with the people. They're not even as concerned with ministerial ta tasks or um, servitude tasks, um, the magician or the sorcerer or sorceress or witch, which is another term we like to use, a warlock, this is an individual who usually will spend a lot of time in isolation and sadly, they start to think that the isolation becomes a necessary component to their manifest manifesting talents and abilities. They don't realize that in most cases, it is their interaction with other people that actually makes their magic stronger because they learn about different archetypes in the world and also that level of support for what they're doing becomes necessary. In fact, um, the magician's greatest friend is the, is the barbarian because it is the barbarian who protects the magician. I know many of you will probably say, well, doesn't magic protect the magician? Not necessarily because being a magician or being a wizard or being a warlock doesn't necessarily mean that you're a warrior. Doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to do protective uh, spells or, or offensive spells or anything like that. What it means is that your primary focus is creation. The magician or the warlock or the sorcerer or sorceress wants to bring things from, a, from, a, from the conscious realm into the realm of materialism, okay? Uh, or someone might say from the unconscious realm to the conscious realm. But they're more concerned about think, bringing things from there to here, okay? So conscious manifestation is really the calling of, of the magician. And what you'll find, whether it be in art or music or spirituality, what the magician is typically um, trying to do is to not just raise the vibration, not just make a point, um, not just innovate, but what the magician is trying to do is to change the very paradigm of the reality of the audience member. They want you to, maybe let's say if it's a magician or a musician or it's a movie, they want you to listen to this and get freaked out. Like you listen to Pink Floyd, you know, and, and other type of psychedelic artists like that. Uh, maybe even an Alice Cooper, you know. Um, they'll use their, their, their musicianship to change the reality. Now, the wizard, or like I said, the magician is the most complex uh, component out of all of them. Um, because with the magician... There's a, there's a lifetime devotion to consciousness. There's a lifetime devotion of what we call the occult, right? And, you know, in many senses, there's that fear there of the occult, a fear of the unknown. And we talk about people shouldn't be afraid, but 
you know, from a mass perspective, the fear is actually warranted. You should think about how many other warlocks used magic and occultism and sorcery to abuse and hurt other people. You know, uh, a great example would be uh, Adolf Hitler. He was an excellent uh, magician. And look at what he did. He used occultism to promote, push, and accomplish his actual agenda. And what he did was he kept the warriors around him to keep them protected, you know? Um, so it's important for us to understand that with this, this, this quadrifold of archetypes, we can start to understand um, what components and who needs to be in place when we're, when we're seeking to unify or when we're seeking to create that destination of unity that I spoke about uh, in our last segment. If any of these components are missing, you're not going to be able to get it done. You got to have the doer, which is the barbarian, the one who says, why are we still talking? Come on, let's just get it done. You're going to have to have that thief that says, it's going to say, listen, this isn't working. Let's do it this way. Well, we're not allowed to do it. Well, we're going to do it that way. <laughs> You're going to need to have the priest who can give everyone those, those pep talks and those motivational speaks. And really, the priest is really good with strategy. The cleric will determine, okay, well, this is how best we can, we can get this done based on who's here and based on the abilities that we have. You know, it's thief is a strategist. And then you're going to need that wizard as well that has the ability to create that new reality, to manifest that new reality. You see, so those are necessary components. Now, there are other aspects and there are other archetypes. I mean, we have many archetypes, right? There's more than just four. Um, for instance, you have the, um, the, 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 um, the hunter, right? We look at Ochosi and we look at that science of archery. We have the archer there. Now, what does the archer represent? The archer is a form of the warrior. So if we look at each one in families or clans, how I always say, when you hear me talk about Arisha, I'll say, oh, you were born out of this family, right? So we have the warrior family or the barbarian family. We have the magician family. We have the priest family. And then we have the thief family. So underneath that warrior family, you would have Ochosi, you would have Shango, you know, even Eshu, but Eshu, that's the trickiness about Eshu, he's a shapeshifter. Eshu fits in all of those categories, you know, um, as does Obatala. So what you have there with Ochosi, you have the warrior, but the warrior who has learned control, right? So um, what, makes the, what makes the arrow so interesting? What, what, why does it keep coming up in our mythology? Um, much different than a sword, much different than a knife, uh, certainly much different than even the gun, right? If you look at um, star, the Star Wars films, why do the Jedi or the Jed, as we know, that's coming from Kemet, um, the, the Jed pillars representing the spine, it's the uprightness, it's the character. And in Star Wars, you have the Jedi, and they are the character or the uprightness. They keep the force, you know, the good side of the force, you know, um, upheld. Um, why do they use lightsabers? Why don't they just use guns? Isn't it easier? Right? Um, well, because it requires control. Just like an archer. You know, when you pull back, you have to wait. You have to aim. You have to do something very, very, very important. That you don't have to do with any other other arts. I mean, you show sure, with gunplay to a degree. You have to breathe. You have to control your breath because if you breathe wrong, it 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 it'll, it'll distort the trajectory of your arrow. You see. So the science of the archer is the science of the warrior who has now learned control. Because with a gun, you could just you know pop off, pop, 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 shoot whatever. You know, with a knife, you know people have have um, crimes of passion. They stab up somebody. You know, they jug them real quick. You know, how many times have you heard about a crime or passion that involved a bow and arrow, right? So, you know, there's different archetypes that exist. Um, a lot of times you have the shield bearer, right? Or in Dungeons and Dragons, they called him the uh, cavalier. That was Eric, he had the shield. And what did that represent? Well, the cavalier represented nobility. It represented the things that we put in front of us, even the mask that we put in front of us to keep us protected. So that's our shield. And without that, we become like human. Like, for instance, if you met someone and their last name uh, was Rothschild, right? Um, you might immediately 
have a certain perception of them. Or if someone said my last name is Obama, oh, you know, so that becomes a shield that causes you not to really see them as human. Even our titles become a shield, you know, chief this, boom, you know. And then if you strip the person of the title, then now you have to see the humanity of them. Some of us, where the problem is with the Cavalier, we can't handle ourselves from that perspective. Once everything is stripped down, we crack. You get to really see the monster that lies underneath that hasn't been resolved, that hasn't been repaired. You know, but those are other archetypes that maybe we'll get into uh, in another segment. But in this piece, I really just wanted to speak about the four core ones and how they relate to unity. Again, when you're creating a destination or a place of unity amongst a group of people and you're finding that, man, we can't seem to get there. You know, or we start and then we fall back, this, that, that. The, you need to now scan your group and to see if these elements, if these individuals are present, and if they are present, are you giving them a role? Do you have the warrior doing something that the magician would do? When the warrior is sitting there, he's sitting there bored, he's, because that's what you do. When you see people in there, they're tapping, they're like this, while you're talking, that's a warrior energy. They want, come on, let's see, what are you doing? What's going on? What's, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, that, that's the warrior. Um, the thief, is looking all that's the one who comes in the room and while he's talking he's looking over your shoulder he's casing the joint you know um so you have to sometimes scan your organization scan yourself ask yourself are all those components active in me am i doing am i going straight to where things need to go you know am i consciously creating see that's the magic the, the, the magician you know or again the wizard the sorcerer sorceress um they're, they're more concerned about conscious creating because they understand that the damage that occurs through unconscious creation. And then you have, of course, are, are, am, am I the priest? Am I touching people? Not necessarily um, trying to preach to people, but am I inspiring people? Am I, am I being an inspiring example? Am I truly devoted to what it is that I'm doing? And then, of course, um, I think I said priest, uh, magician, warrior, the thief, you know, do you, are, is the thief active in you? Are you looking at the things that you've been doing all this time and working to, do, working to improve it upon it? You know, so those are just some of the things that we can look at, but uh, this is all in, in, a, in, a, in an effort to bring greater unity. If you want to understand this better, go look at uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the episodes are on YouTube right now it's an old 80s cartoon um you can look at any of the conan movies you can look at the uh mythica series you can check out the hobbit you know and lord of the rings of course um there's a bunch of them oh the dragon slayer there's another one uh it's a lot of them uh game of thrones even has these same elements present you know, so almost any mythical thing where there's going to be a journey, you're going to see it. You're going to see this this sorcerer. You're going to see the knight. Who's, you know, the knight is the barbarian, the warrior. And you're going to see the sorcerer. And then you're going to see the thief. You know, usually what they do, if it's a magical type show, they'll give the thief the ability to cloak themselves. They'll give them the cloak of, of, of uh, invisibility like you have in uh, the Fantastic Four and also like you have in uh, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, they, they'll have either a helmet, because remember like Hermes' helmet, helmet he had the helmet of, of uh, invisibility, or you'll have like a cloak they could put over them and they become invisible, like in Clash of the Titans. It's always gonna be present, those elements are necessary. All right, that has been our Chief Speaks for this segment. I wanna thank you all for listening, and uh, be sure that if you're not a member of our new spiritual training, or not a student, that you come and you sign up, if you haven't taken any of the classes on the SuduluHouse.com website, I encourage you to come and be a student. And especially for those of you who want to be a part of this movement and this ministry, I encourage you. That's the priest in me, you see. <laughs> I encourage you and I inspire you to go to AnuLifeGlobal.org. And of course, the links are popping up on the bottom of this video and have been the whole time I've been speaking. So you can find everything there. And for those of you who want readings, you know, uh, just go to askosiris.com, askosiris.com. All right, so until 
next show. And of course, this Tuesday, we'll be back with Community from 1 to 3. Uh, make sure you guys call in 347-945-7680, 1 to 3 Eastern. Uh, you can tune into Community Radio, and uh, we can talk and chop it up there until such time. Self-actualization is actualizing the mission and idea of the soul. In order for new life to come, the old life has to rock. We realize the self is actually that higher entity, that which controls life. You're supposed to birth yourself into these realities and then kill yourself out of those realities. That's the only escape from a matrix. It's death. Everything here is dying. Everything here is corrupted. Everything, even your beautiful sunset, is a corruption of the real sun. What is your body to your soul? A vehicle of travel. What are the things that you do that are not for money? So we speak about the independent phenomenon of self-actualization. You know, no rules. I'm going to do what I need to do. Anu Nation is home to the Anu Spiritual Order founded by Chief Jegna Haru Yuya Asan Anu. Some of the components of Anu Nation are Anu Life Global Ministries, Enlightenment and Transformation, Sadulu House, and Osiris Life Spiritual Services. SaduluHouse.com is the school component of Anu Nation where spiritual empowerment through education and training is emphasized. One way that is accomplished is through our monthly webinars. Our webinars are packed with foundational information, rituals, and live instruction to empower your spiritual work. At SaduluHouse.com, you can view our diverse list of topics for this year that range from meditation to sex magic. And you can also register for any of the webinars at your convenience, sign up for our introductory Orisha class, schedule a spiritual reading, and sign up for the Anu Spiritual Training Course. Enlightenment and Transformation is the media component of Anu Nation. Here, you can view all of our archive shows from over the years to our current segments. They include Chief Speaks, Masterminds Monday, Anu Asafo, Thunderground Thursdays, and Foundational Fridays. You can also visit us on our YouTube channels. They are Enlightenment and Transformation, Orisha Yoruba, and Anu Nation. Osiris Life Spiritual Services is for those who are ready to take the necessary actions to bring your life into holistic balance. Here we offer consistent monthly one-on-one -on -one coaching, solutions that are tailored just for you, practical hands-on self-development techniques that will accompany your monthly readings, and customize practical strategies designed for you that guarantee positive results. Simply choose the package that best fits your needs. And last but not least, AlphaOmegaStore.com. The Alpha Omega Store is our online botanica where we offer divination tools, herbs and incense, DVDs, books, and other hard to find ritual items. You can also get our best-selling foundational book, Grasping the Root of Divine Power. Other great works from Anu Nation are Shrine and Altar, Solutions for Dysfunctional Family Relationships, and Natural Hair for Young Women. All great books to assist you on your journey. To find out more on how to get involved with Anu Nation, visit our websites and YouTube channels and be sure to sign up for our monthly newsletter. <laughs>